Hello, my name is Lucy Jones and I'm going to read from the novel Eva by um, Verena Kessler, which is published by Hansa Verlag. Eva Lawhouse arrived with a golden retriever and introduced her to me as Maddie. Like the missing girl, I almost asked, but then just smiled and watched the dog lie down obediently under the table. Well trained, I said. Yes, she said, with dogs it's possible. My editor had warned me that Low House was odd and that I shouldn't let her intimidate me. I'd waved her concern away, saying I was perfectly able to ask a few questions to a teacher with little media expertise without getting flustered. But now I wasn't so sure. She had a natural superiority that brought back a memory of standing in front of the whole class, not being able to solve a problem on the blackboard. She ordered tea and so did I. When the server left, I put the recording device between us and turned it on. Well then, she said and gave me a challenging look. My stomach fluttered and I felt the urge to put my hand on it, but managed to stop myself. Miss Lawhouse, in your essay, Contraception Saves Lives, you suggest that people should no longer reproduce as a way to tackle the climate crisis. Your text has been hotly discussed and provoked outrage in some quarters. You've even received death, th death threats. Did you expect this reaction? I'd just managed to get out the last word when she answered, giving me the sinking feeling that my question had been too obvious. Of course, of course I expected it. Germans get incensed if you even dare suggest they should eat fewer sausages. But when it comes to children, that's the end of the line, a complete no-no. People wanted to misunderstand me. I never said that all under 10-year-olds should be euthanized. She gathered her curly, dark blonde hair, streaked with a few strands of grey, in one hand, holding it briefly in the nape of her neck, and then propped her forearms on the table. It's all a bit ridiculous, the whole thing. The server arrived with our tea and there was a short pause while we both dunked our tea bags into the hot water. You write that not having a child could save 58.6 tonnes of CO2 per year. The way you came up with that figure has meanwhile been heavily criticised. But even if we let that stand for a moment, is not having children the only answer? She laughed as if she couldn't believe I'd really asked her this, as if she'd explained it to me a thousand times already, and that I was a bit dim. Well, she said, of course we could go without electricity and cars, stop flying, stop eating meat, drastically curb our consumption and live in small unheated houses. But even then, the same question would remain. What are we supposed to live off? Farmland is a finite resource and every wood and moor we clear to grow crops increases greenhouse gases. The oceans are overfished, empty in fact, and we don't need any more little mouths to, to eat fish fingers. Infinite growth on a finite planet doesn't work, it's a simple calculation. She shrugged briefly and gave me a look as if checking whether her message had finally gone in. Then she took the porcelain lid off her cup and pulled the tea bag, tea bag out which had been brewing for less than two minutes. So you think it's better to give those who are already living on the planet a decent life with fewer restrictions? I think not having children will spare suffering. It must be obvious to everyone by now that people born today will feel the full consequences of the climate crisis. Wars over resources are very likely to break out and affect the entire planet. The best thing parents can do for their children is not have them in the first place. I reached for one of the sachets of sugar in the middle of the table, tore it open and tipped it into my tea. I didn't want any sugar, but I needed those five seconds to get a grip on my emotions. Have you always known that you never wanted children, I asked, immediately regretting it. I shouldn't have got personal with her. I wasn't that kind of journalist. I felt my cheeks glowing, but Lowhouse instantly looked completely at ease. She smiled like a person who'd been proven right in the end. 
I'm not politicising a personal tragedy in retrospect, if that's what you mean. I still menstruate very regularly. After the interview, I took the underground to the newspaper. I stuck in my earpods, wanting to shut out the world for a few minutes. I felt a tugging in my chest, but refused to read anything into it. It was still too early. The carriage was almost empty, and yet at the next station, a man with his daughter of about two years sat down opposite me. She stood on the seat, on the seat in her shoes and slapped her little hands against the smeared window. When she started to lick the glass pane, he took her onto his lap. I thought the girl looked familiar, but I didn't recognise her father. Perhaps I stared at her for too long, because she pointed at me all of a sudden and laughed. Her father said something and laughed too, but I couldn't hear anything because my music was too loud. Discreetly, I turned the volume down. The girl pointed at me again, and this time I understood what she was saying. Mama! That's not Mama, silly Billy, said the father, gently pushing his daughter's hand down. Mama's at the office, you know that. Mama, she said again, cracking up with laughter. Mama, Mama. I pretended not to hear and looked out of the window again. I'd stopped believing in signs like these long ago. It had just started at some point and from then on never stopped. We must have been in our mid-twenties when the topic crept into conversations between girlfriends and we started asking each other if we could imagine it, what the right time was, how many we wanted and with whom. For a while it was all just theory and we acted like there was all the time in the world, as if our gynaecologist didn't remind us at every checkup that we shouldn't wait too long. But then the first of my friends took the plunge. Are you scared? I wanted to ask when she told me she was pregnant. What if you, lo what if you don't like being a mother? What if you realise it's not your thing? But I didn't say that. She didn't seem scared and I didn't want to be the one to bring up those thoughts. When my second friend told me, I was less surprised, and from the third on, I already knew when one of them was gearing up to tell me. They all gave off the same nervous, excited buzz, then launched into their news with a broad grin, and the words, There's something I still have to tell you. I became an expert at giving the right reaction, a gush of, Oh, how lovely! Followed by a hug, congratulations, and a radiant smile. I trotted out the standard questions. How do you feel? When are you due? How are you going to split parental leave? It was like acting out a play. The lines were always the same, only the audience changed. But I wasn't the only one with lines. There was always a standard question from the other side too. It never took long to pop up like an annoying banner. And what about you two? Thank you.